Welcome to the Alcohol Addiction Podcast. I'm your host, Lee Davey. I am not an alcoholic. I refuse to be anonymous. I do apologize about the background here. I'm uh, in between homes at the moment, so I'm kind of sharing a flat with a friend of mine, so that's why it's all pretty boring. I like your background, though, with the old whiteboard there, a second yes. brain at work. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> How's life, Dr. Amy Johnson? It's great. I'm happy to be here. I always like it when I speak to someone who's a doctor because it always tells me that at some point during their life, they have really worked very hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at some point. <laughs> yeah, at some point. Um, Amy, let's just crack straight into this. I, only, I know we've only got an hour. Uh, I've been in California for the last six months. I haven't seen my son in six months because he's over here, 16 years of age. He's been in the UK. I've now been here a week, I say, so I'm still kind of on a tail end of jet lag. My wife and my 15-month-old daughter are in America. They're going to come and join me in a couple of weeks. And today I've really struggled. I, I've been trying to be really positive, but today I've really struggled. And as I look out the window here right now, it's gloomy, it's raining, it's dark, it's, the water's brown um, below me in the river. And last week it was blue when I was in the Bahamas. And it's really affecting my mood. And I was reading one of your blog posts and you said, we're confusing the weather with us. What does that mean? What am I doing wrong here, Amy? Why am I driving myself to it, misery when I don't have to? What's going on? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I don't, as far as I can see, we aren't in charge of the way that life shows up through us. So absolutely, like there are times when things just look brown and dreary, whether they are or not. <laughs> Even with a nice blue sky and blue water, it can look brown and dreary, right? Like right, it's true, yeah. in our experience. And there are times when it doesn't. And that's always changing. And it isn't up to us. And it isn't about us. And it isn't, you know, it isn't personal. It isn't something we're doing wrong. It isn't something we need to fix or change. It's just the way life sometimes shows up. Now, that sometimes people hear that, especially people who have been on this fix it, change it, self help, you know, ride for several decades, many of them. And that just sounds like, no, I'm not cool with that. I want it better now. I want a, I want a nice thought that's going to change my, my mood, you know, it's going to turn things around right away. If that works, wonderful. Never worked for me. It's, I, I've never seen it work sustainably for anyone. It's hard. It, we know we're trying to change our mood. <laughs> like if you try to think on the bright side, you know, or do something like that, you're on to it. Duh, you're the one doing it. Like it, we don't fool ourselves. So it isn't, it isn't complete and it doesn't feel authentic. So what helps is seeing, okay, yeah, thought brings our experience thought like and when i say thought i don't mean little thinking i mean like this energy that moves through us in life brings experience and we don't make it happen but what we do know is that our mind is kind of like the human body and that the human body is designed to float now it can go underwater we can do all kinds of fun things underwater but if you just let go that body's going to come to the surface and our mind's going to do the same thing our mind wants to clear and move on and be in a fresh, open place. And we innocently, every human on earth has nothing to do with enlightenment or reading the right thing or any of that. Every human on earth at times, we get caught up in our experience and we don't like it. and We want to feel better and we try to fix it. And we do all these things that innocently kind of keep it in place, you know, and keep us just kind of in the flow of what wants to naturally happen. Is there a positive side to this as well then? Because, bear with me a minute, the reason I raised that initial um, start out question, if you like, is there are a lot of people now on the Strive Community Forum who will be feeling triggered to drink alcohol because of the weather. And they'll call it seasonal affective disorder or whatever it is, which is quite funnily um, is an acronym of SAD, you know. Um, but here's the thing. In the first 35 years of my life, when I was a drinker, and I was very much rooted 
to this little valley in Ogmore Vale with 3,000 people, and I never traveled anywhere. I never remember complaining habitually about the weather in a way that was actually feeling internally like it was damaging me. It was almost like I looked out the window and was like, oh, it's raining again, and I got on with life. Yeah. And then I traveled the world, saw the blue sky, saw a, a, a world with no clouds, so I didn't feel so penned in, saw blue water, et cetera, et cetera, and wonderful trees and different forms of nature. And then I come back, and now everything looks different. It's, what I'm saying is a positive thing is it's – it can allow you to wake up maybe and want to go for something more to change your circumstances or are you saying we don't need to change our circumstances everything is as it should be and it's in it's inside here that we need to be focused on and not our external environment yeah i mean i don't believe our external environment can directly impact us. Right. So, I mean, so, so last week in the Bahamas and this week in miserable Wales, it's my thinking about the situation that is causing either misery or happiness, not the actual weather or... It's, it's the way energy is moving through you. It's what's being created through you. And part of that, yes, might be if you're sitting around thinking, this sucks, I wish I was back in the Bahamas. Where's my family? Why am I here? Why is my background so blah? You know, like if you're thinking any of that, you're going to be feeling it. Hmm. But it's bigger than that. It's not like the sentences and the stories we're consciously carrying around. It's so much bigger than that. It's like you're a human being and you have moods and stuff shows up in big deal because it also goes away by itself. So it's that... You know, and then, and then separate from that, we want to do things in life. Maybe you want to travel, you want to move out, you want to get better at something, you want to change something. That's wonderful. That's all kind of the game of life. It's part of what we're here to do as human beings. But that's kind of the game part, you know, like that doesn't, we don't need to find the right weather, the right location, the right setup in order for, like, it's not going to have any kind of reliable impact on how we feel. So just to wrap my head around that then to make sure that I got that right, because I think this is an important point for me anyway to, to get it. Yeah. Right now I'm in, in, in Wales and it's a bit miserable out. Obviously it is going to be because it's February. And sometimes I'm going to feel in a less than super mood and sometimes I'm going to feel in a really super mood. And that's happened in the last two days. One day super mood, one day negative mood. Now, accepting and understanding that allows me to break this story, this narrative that I've created in my mind that the reason I'm miserable is because I'm here, when in fact that cannot be true because yesterday I was here and if it was true, I would be miserable then as well. Yes. That's what you're saying. Yes. And, and it's huge for people to look in the right direction. When we start pinning how we feel on things that can't create a feeling, we're in trouble. <laughs> you know, that, that's the definition of powerless. It's the definition of anxiety. It's the definition of hopeless because we're looking out here for something that, and we're trying to get something from it that it can't possibly give us. That's why we drink. It's why we eat. It's why we do drugs because we feel all this stuff and, and we're saying, Hey, you know, why aren't you giving me what I want? <laughs> I'm doing all the right things and I still feel bad. And we get all confused in that. And then we need to do something to distract from that pain. So we only, we only know what's going on in our own mind, obviously. And I'm the world's worst person for this, for thinking, oh, this is how I think. So everybody, including Amy, thinks the same way, right? So let's just get that right out there in the open straight away. It seems to me, it seems to, I'm obviously thinking that this, this wrong way of thinking about this, this, this way of attaching to external stimuli and almost letting it lead our lives, to me feels natural. It feels like it's the human thing to do. And I assume that everybody else feels like that until you have some sort of revelation or some teaching or some coaching otherwise. What do you think about that? Uh, I think that's mostly right. <laughs> I think right. it's a very pervasive misunderstanding. And, and why then? Why? 
everything, it, why did it start? I don't know. I mean, you know, the, the world is so vivid and our eyes look out that way. Our eyes don't look at our thoughts creating it. We can't see that. That's invisible. Hmm. So we pin it, it being our feelings, on whatever's around. Your kid walks in the room. You're overwhelmed with this feeling of love. Must be the kid doing it. It's a gray day. Must be the day doing it. Like it, there's a certain logic to that, that once we start thinking it works that way, and again, parents tell us this, you know, just even subtly, like in what they're saying, movies show us this. It's everywhere. But once we get that frame of mind, like once it looks that way, we just confirm it all over the place. But you're right. When someone flips that for you and says, it cannot possibly be true, then, then things can start to unravel and you start to see it the other way. It's almost like uh, I look at my 15-month-old and she doesn't care if it's raining, sunny or not. The whole world is magical to her. And at some point, our influence and our conversations and our dialogue as mentors and parents and marketing and advertising shapes her rel reliance on like this external stimuli instead of internal. I think... A good example, I, was, uh, I did a video on my monologue show on nocebos, uh, the belief that when you quit drinking alcohol, you're going to have some crazy and nasty effects and withdrawals because the world says that's what you're likely to, to, to happen. And I guess seasonal affective disorder is the same. Like if you read about it and talk about it and you know or you think it exists, then it's easy to slap your feelings onto that and use that as an excuse rather than dealing with your own internal um, humanness or whatever we want to call it. Yeah. And if you believe that you're upset because of the weather, depressed because of the weather, you're kind of screwed because, you know, if you live where you do or where I do in Michigan, because you're not getting much relief until like April. <laughs> you know, and you'll discount anything that comes your way, you know, before that, because you just know how it goes. Like, so yeah. it's trap yeah I'm, I'm, you know i don't believe that alcohol is a brain disease um and the reason i don't want to believe that is because it, it it means that i'm not in control so i need to apply the same thought process to the weather i can't control the weather here's a question for you then um can i control my thoughts Well, I'm such a coach. I want to throw it back to you, but I'll do it. Do it. <laughs> What's your experience? Do you feel like you control your thoughts? I feel like I can control some of them. Like I can deliberately man manufacture a thought right now. Like I, I, I manufactured a thought that told me to say, do it, do it. But then I read your post on meditation. So when you sat down and you, and you wanted to be the best meditator in the world and a million thoughts just raced into your head. I don't believe that you created them. So I have people on the Strive Forum who um, have these thoughts going through the head, tell them to drink, 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 drink. I don't believe they're creating them. And I think disassociating yourself, yourself in inverted commas, from those thoughts can be very helpful. On the yes. right lines. I completely agree. I, I mean, we have some free will and some ability to think about something, but that's so short lived. You know, like if I said, okay, think we can sit here and think about elephants. But if I said, I'll give you $10 million, if you can think about nothing but elephants all day, you couldn't do it. No. It's, you know, there's, there's a momentum happening. And I love what you said that about seeing that our thoughts aren't us and they aren't ours like that we aren't the creator of them in any purposeful, intentional way. And they don't even belong to us. They're not even like of us. They kind of move through us. That little thing right there, one of the hugest things, like most helpful things I've seen people, especially with addictions and habits, see that because we walk around taking it all so personally. And that just yeah. makes you drink. Yeah, definitely. Because everybody's looking at self-flagellation, isn't it? It's like, I really have to beat myself up. E e even the, the thought of not beating yourself up and being loving to yourself, it's just so terrifying for some people. And, and that's why I think that people like to attach themselves to these thoughts so they can blame themselves, really. Um, I it gives an illusion of control. You know, if you think you know, if you think you're the creator, it gives you this weird illusion, okay, well, then I can maybe change it someday. Or, you right. know, like this weird sense of, we're pulling the strings, but we aren't. And that's good news. Now that, that in itself though can terrify some people, right? 
Because people, if people accept that they're in control, then they have to accept failure for their um, position, which I guess is why a lot of people like to lean on the alcohol is a genetic disease and it was hereditary and there's nothing I could do about it. Ergo means I don't have any control over it, so I can't take responsibility for it. So I, I think a lot of addicts, the responsibility part of it freaks them out a bit. So um, I really think this is a key, key area for people who are listening to this to read about, learn about, research about, accept. I think it's like super important as well. Yeah. Um, you wrote the little big book of change and um, you talked about the no willpower approach to breaking a habit. And for a lot of people who drink alcohol and, and it's gone out of control and it's a terrible habit, it's really difficult for them to get their head around the fact that this isn't a willpower thing. Yeah. And you talk about insight versus willpower and misunderstanding human experience. Can you expand upon that a little bit? Yeah. So it's really kind of, you know, we can draw a lot of parallels between what we started talking about is just your mood or, or thoughts, negative thoughts maybe that are in your head today, you know, and, and we can use willpower, like a willpower approach, whether it's about drinking, the thoughts are about drinking or the weather or how you feel or whatever, like, you know, willpower is something that we have some to some degree, but it's obviously an exhaustible resource. We don't have, we don't have infinite amounts of it and it, and it takes work and it takes effort. And we go in and we use more thinking. See, everything's created through thinking to begin with. Mm. So it's us generating more thinking to try to beat up the thinking we don't like, which is really kind of a mess because it puts, like we were saying earlier, you know, you could just be in like, okay, I'm in a mood. That's just energy moving through me. You could, you could like your 15 month old say, or like you did as a young person, oh, it's raining out, whatever, and go on with your day. And that's going to just move and change so naturally through you because you don't care. You're not holding on to it and beating it up and doing all this stuff to change it. Well, that's what willpower does. I mean, it's almost the, there's a good intention behind it, but it still requires that thought and feeling and cravings and urges, whatever that's moving through us, literally wants to move through us because that's its nature. We stop it and we say, I don't like you. You're wrong. You shouldn't be here, which means we take it very personally. We think it's all about us, you know, and there's so, so much garbage put on it. And then we try to beat it up with a better thought. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to drink. And this is how I won't drink. And all that does is stop, put in place, like cement into place. It's not really cemented, but stops in its tracks. Something that wants to move through you. Mm. So the more, you know, we get to be this, lately I've been calling it the container. They're just metaphors. But, you know, the more the world was like a container for life. It's not us. It's not ours. Like you said, it's just, it's just what's showing up and we don't take it personally and it isn't about us and all that stuff. And we see that we're designed to float mentally, that we do bounce back and it's no big deal. The more it just goes and it. And when it goes, we haven't given it so much meaning and attention and it doesn't tend to come back. Like it starts to look different. So that's kind of the insight is just seeing we're okay right now. It's ridiculous to think we have to, beat up a thought or fight it in some way so people listening to this will be thinking oh that's okay for you and, and lee to say um that i that these thoughts just want to just pass through me but they don't shut up they're just always there they just keep on going all the time how can we give somebody some practical advice practical steps for them to move from almost trapping these thoughts because they do pass very quickly and i always tell uh, our movement Time them, uh, observe them, and time. And it's just like not even minutes. So, but but how can we give some practical advice to someone who's really struggling with this? You know, one thing I think is interesting is to look at other thoughts. Like we'll all say, "Oh yeah, no, my cravings don't change. My grief, my insecurity doesn't move." You know, but thoughts about you know what's for lunch, or what time is it? Or what am I going to wear tomorrow? You know, like those come and go. We don't even recognize we had them half the time. Hmm. So thought, and all thought is the same. Like there's nothing special about a thought because it's painful or because it talks about drinking versus lunch. I mean, they're not different. It's all the same energy moving through us. It's just that we just let so much of it go. 
which proves that it wants to move and that it moves freely on its own. And others of it, we give all this meaning and importance and fear to. That's the only difference, you know? So I get it because I, I had an addiction myself. And, you know, like when those thoughts came up, it, they didn't feel like they just came and went. I thought that was insane to hear people say that, you know? And I said the same thing, good for you, but mine don't work that way. But now what I can see about that is that they do, they want to work that, like by nature they work that way, but we innocently, and it's so innocent, we innocently, we misunderstand them. So we get in with our willpower and our fear and all that stuff, and we just kind of keep a spotlight on them. So are we saying then that the key, one of, one of the key uh, starting points here is to develop a keen observation about what is even going on. So I, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, so if, if we can say, if we say, let's have a look at what other thoughts are going on in our, in our life. What suddenly comes up to me when you say that is, oh, there are times when I don't even think about what I'm thinking about. Like that in itself is a very powerful thought. Right, because it because it shows that I can probably let's say I drive fifty miles down the road, and I'm it's one of those times when I'm on autopilot. So my body is taking over the mind, and the body is driving the car, not the mind. And the mind in that moment is not frozen; it's still doing its thing. It's still churning out thoughts that I am not creating. But by the time I get 50 miles down the road, I can't remember even getting there, let alone having a thought, which in itself, if you're in a, if you're in a mode of observation and reflection about this issue, you can take that as a positive as if, because you then realize that it's only paying attention to these thoughts or bringing awareness to them. I think it's um, the Sydney Banks quote you had on your website. If the only thing people learned was to not to be afraid of their experience, that alone will change the world. Yeah. So to me, an experience is always physical. Like, you know, it's like, this is an experience we're having, but of course, internally we're having experiences as well. Right. Yeah, totally. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't suggest as like a blanket strategy for everyone that we get really, we get into the content of our thinking only because and some, and that doesn't mean no, you know, sometimes that's the thing to do. And like you just saw having that bigger awareness that, wow, I, there's so much thought that shows up that like you said, even in driving the car, think about how your mind has to filter what you even see. I mean, there's so much stimuli driving a car that you're not even, you're, it's there somewhere, it's hitting you, but it's not even like, you know, being, being given much energy or anything, it can't be. So it's already such a, like, like the parts we focus on and blow up and look at and all of that internally, it's really, really subjective and kind of arbitrary and just not meaningful. You know, we go through life thinking we're, like you said earlier, we're seeing it the way it is, you know, or even internally. I'm thinking about it the same way everyone else is. Oh my gosh. I mean, we have totally different experiences because we only experience our, the internal. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, just, I just think that it's really difficult for somebody who's stuck in addiction, as you know, as I know, to listen to a podcast like this where two people are talking about thoughts in such a seemingly arbitrary way yeah. and yet it's absolutely plaguing their lives like they they because I, I i get this i'll read somebody talking on a strike community forum about how i'm anxious to this i'm anxious to that i'm anxious to this i'm anxious to that everything's driving me crazy and i'm thinking to myself i have all those anxieties as well but I don't feel like you're feeling. Yeah. And I'm not, I don't think I'm doing anything to prevent those feelings from escalating to the same place you are, which makes me then think, what, what, am, what, are, what is my body doing and my mind doing that your body and mind isn't doing because I'm not doing anything? Yeah. Does that make sense? It does. So do you know the answer? I mean, not the answer, but do you know something about that? I, if I was to guess, 
I would say that I'm very experienced at dealing with anxiety because of my career on the railway for 20 years and my upbringing. And I have faced a lot of anxiety and a lot of confrontation in my life. And I've been in situations where I've had to deal with it. I've had to, I couldn't allow it to blow up. A good example is in, in your work. Let's say you're in a very, very challenging position. You're in a meeting. You're absolutely riddled with anxiety because you cannot, you don't understand what anybody's saying, what anything's going on. And you have this position. And right now in that moment, you cannot erupt. Then I just learned to deal with it. And I guess I've never thought about it before, but the way of dealing with it is to just let it do its job and to just go on its way. And I guess I've just done that naturally. It feels like I've done that naturally. Um, but for some other people, it just seems so unnatural. Yeah. So in that, though, it isn't necessarily like there may be things that you do. There are, I'm sure, that you do or have done differently than those other people. But it isn't in doing. It's in, it's in how it looks to you in any given moment. And I don't even mean what you know or understand about it. Because we're here sharing what we know and understand about it. Like I know for absolute fact that anxiety is completely safe, completely normal. It will leave on its own and it's completely self-correcting. There's not a problem in the world with it. I know that as a fact. Yeah. Is that I'm never going to feel anxiety again? No. We because want I don't necessarily see that in any given moment. Yeah. In some moment, if my heart starts racing or my mind starts racing, I could feel anxiety because in that moment, I will see my experience like, like realize my experience for myself as a scary thing. And that then you're going to feel anxiety. Like the people in your forum that are saying this and this and this, they, I would bet, are seeing that life out there is doing stuff to them. And that is incredibly anxiety provoking, but it's also not true. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. So you somehow, I don't, you know, kind of, you know, we, you don't want to say like it's, you know, people should go have this kind of demanding career and all this stuff. And then they'll be with anxiety the way you are. Cause I don't think none of that, any of that really did it. It's more that somewhere along the line, you in, in certain moments, especially you started to see that thoughts do come and go. You started to just, without even knowing that you see that your relationship with anxiety and thoughts and feelings kind of shifted to be more manageable. I think, I think, and this is very important to talk about. I think you have some people who quite clearly are struggling with anxiety and they externally show that that they, that, you know, there's a, there's a visible external reaction to it. They freak out, they shout, they cry, uh, they shake, they breathe into, you know, they have all our panic attacks and, and there's that. Okay. And then there's, there's people like myself who don't believe they, they suffer from, anxiety which is of course impossible because everybody does but we think that we don't because we we view anxiety as being a bad thing that that is this external um reaction and then we hide it somehow so i'm still not dealing with it correctly i'm still not i know i don't know what the right answer is i'm not doing the right thing and then somewhere along the line i'll blow up in a completely different area and, yeah. and then when I seek some professional help, I'll realize it's because I'm, I'm riddled with anxiety, yet I've been going on through my life saying, I, I'm not anxious. Amy's anxious, but I'm not anxious. What's her problem? Um, yeah. And I guess then there's someone like yourself who has learned and developed, I don't know what to call it again, a method or the way, a way of being, or you've realized um, that anxiety is part of who you are and you manage to not let it affect you as much as it once did. You know, I know I'm labeling different categories yes. here, but you know, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah. So, so what I would see at that end of people who, who they're not suppressing it and they're not emoting it all over the place. They're really good, really good with their feelings. Right. I wouldn't, let's not say me, but you know, just someone in that category. They, there's nothing they've learned. There's no method. There's nothing they're doing. And I mean, they're doing things naturally, but there's nothing they're applying. They feel okay in their experience. It's like most children 
It's like most children, almost all children, before they get into that big conceptual right, wrong, scary, not scary, for the first few years of a child's life, they feel all kinds of stuff, a ton of stuff, and they feel it strongly, but they're not afraid of it. They don't think, oh man, I hope I'm not anxious. Your 15 month old doesn't think, oh man, I'm a basket case. I might be bipolar. I was really sad and then I was really happy. A 30 year old will think that. And before you know it, they think they're bipolar and they're judging everything and they're afraid of everything. A 15 month old doesn't do that. They just feel they're just in life without all the labels and concepts. And so because of the design of life is such that, I mean, it is, per it could not be more in our favor. It could not be more ideal. It just, life moves through us. There is no such thing as good or bad. It takes a human mind to say painful, not painful, good, bad, all of that. It's just life. We need to take that concepts, the good, bad, this, that, you know, all that kind of stuff, like all that separation, that's all just thinking. It's all, it takes a brain to make that shit up, you know, and it really is made up. It's not, there's a different truth there where everything is all one and we're always safe and we're always healthy. And, and once people start to get a glimpse of that bigger truth, they still feel anxious, they still want to drink, they still have all kinds of human stuff, thank God we get to still be human, but they don't take it so seriously, and they know it isn't them. Okay, so what's going on for me now then is, I think you're telling me that I am perfect, and I have always been perfect as a yes. human being. Not, not as an arrogant, egotistical narcissist. Yeah. As a human being, I've always been perfect. There's nothing wrong with me. Everything that is going on is normal and natural. And I exacerbate it by thinking that it's anything different. It's almost like we're all in a room. We're all in this room. And there's 10 people. We've been here for six months. Everybody keeps pushing the door. And it won't open. And then after six months, someone pulls it and it opens yeah. and now everybody goes. There was never anything wrong with the door. Yes. We were thinking that there was something wrong with it. That's exactly what I'm telling you. <laughs> okay. Right. Exactly. So I get that. But that's not a, that's not a principle, thought process, call it what you want, that's going to stick with me naturally because I've moved so far away from believing that I'm perfect. I somehow need to change back to my original state of being. And I don't know how to do that. Okay. So let's look at your room metaphor. Once someone pulls the door, you guys were in there for six months Someone pulls the door once, you're all out. Do you think you're going to forget that? Do you have to work to remember to pull the door? You push that door for six months. That's a long time. But you don't need to work to remember to pull the door because you've seen a different truth. Okay. That's you have deeply seen, in that case, that the door opens by pulling. Done. It's over. No work needed. It's when you said once people get a glimpse of that human truth. Uh, yeah. uh, right. So... I remember talking to Greg Suki about this, and I said to Greg, I'm, I'm, always look, I'm always on the lookout for the moment that I get it, and I become enlightened or whatever, and I realize that I'm this perfect human being, and all these problems don't affect me like they used to. I'm, I'm waiting for a moment. And, and then Greg reminded me, Lee, you gave up drinking alcohol, after reading a book, 30, 30, 20 odd years of drinking alcohol, and you gave up after reading a book. Maybe that was your moment, but, but you don't recognize it as in a moment because you're expecting yeah. fireworks and kazoos to go off and to see like Deepak Chopra with all shimmery energy around him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and think about it like, you know, yeah, the door. Oh, you pull it open. Oh my gosh, crazy. You shuffle out of the room and you go on with your life. I mean, it, you know what I mean? It's not all, I think that's so big to see. Like, and I hear that with people I work with all the time. We're always looking for the insight and it's going to have all those special effects, you know, in, in angels and music with it. And 
it's just commonplace. It's just, it all, you know, it's just seeing something that you didn't see a second ago. Okay. However, I would never have quit drinking alcohol. <clears throat> well, no, that's not true. Hang on a minute. Maybe I would have, I would have quit alcohol at some point. I'm pretty certain of that. But at the time, I believed that I gave up because of this book. Okay. So I gave, I read a book, I gave up alcohol. So I believe that's why I gave up drinking alcohol. Right. Mm -hmm. I now believe thinking about it for the first time that had I not picked up that book, somehow I would have stopped drinking alcohol because I had made the vow that I was going to do that. Right. But it took me to pick up the book to read something that somebody else had written to trigger a thought in my mind that told me that there is no value to drinking alcohol. That was the moment, that was my open in the door moment. And, and, and after I got that, there was no way that I was going to drink alcohol again. So, but I needed, I needed something or someone to show me that the door needed to be pushed open. Okay, so what, tell me if you think this is possible. That right, and this seems like a very subtle change on what you said, but I think it might be kind of big. Maybe it wasn't so much that you read this book and new ideas and new thoughts came to you from the book. So it wasn't maybe the addition of a new thought that said, Hey, you don't have to drink alcohol anymore, and then suddenly you did it. Maybe your nature all along always knew that you didn't need to drink alcohol, you had this stuff in the way that was pain and anxiety and I don't know how to cope and can I quit and all that garbage. And for a moment, and it happened with the book in your hand, that's fine. But for a moment, all that thinking that was in the way cleared and you spoke to you. So it wasn't, it's not a fact we learn and that's just my opinion, but it's not a fact we learn. It's not a tidbit of information or a thought we had to gain. It's in there all the time, which says something about how we go about, <laughs> about it, because that means you don't have to read every book under the sun and pray to God that this is the savior and this is the answer because it isn't, it's in you get quiet. That's why people go out in nature or go to a meeting or talk to somebody or cry and confess to their wife or whatever it is. And they see things differently. Okay. I always felt that drinking alcohol was wrong. So you, you spot on. I always thought it was wrong, but I was always terrified to not do it because I didn't want people to think that I was, there was something wrong with me. So I, I, I only drank alcohol to fit into the tribe. So I can totally see how at some point along the line, particularly as you get older and you start maturing and you become more confident about how you fit in around the world, i.e. you become more confident to be alone uh, and be comfortable in that, then I can see how that decision could have been made to quit without having the book in my hand or not. I think what terrifies me listening to what you're talking about, I guess, is that I have 30 to 40 people at the moment on a community forum who we all believe that we're all helping each other and supporting each other to change. And listening to you, it, it, it sounds like we don't need that. At some point, we will just get it. But, but, but isn't that support system still needed, still valuable? Have I missed something? Well, there's a big difference between needed and valuable. Okay. I mean, it just helps, but it can't be that you need it because, again, we have examples of people all the time who quit, quit drinking in isolation. Mm -hmm. with no support. It happens. Yes. So it's possible. It's, it's just as possible that the weather is creating your mood as it is that you need support to quit. Of course you don't. But is it helpful? Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> is it nicer? Is it easier? Is it good for you guys? If it feels good to be in that community, is it good? Yes. And if it feels bad for someone to be in any kind of community, get out because you don't need it. I know. I'm best not of all worlds, right? It's like, hey, they're, they're there because they want to be and only to, the, to as long as it's beneficial. And if it isn't, it's okay. I know, I'm, I know it sounds like I'm searching for this cookie cutter approach here. And I know when I talk to David Burns, the author of Feeling Good on my podcast, every time I was asking him to give me some advice or something, he was like, 
you know, I could tell he was like, dude, 7.5 billion people, they're all different. There's no like approach here. But the reason I'm pushing it so hard, and I think it's really important, is when people are desperate, when people are really can't see how they can get out of the mess they're in, they really need more help. They really, really need, they're looking for basically, a, you know, directions. Like they're looking for a map, uh, sobriety. Uh, here's the map, how you get there. And of course, we know that doesn't exist. But I'm pretty confident that reading the book, uh, the circumstances in my life at the time, who I surrounded myself with, that kind of stuff, is, is more likely to ignite that, oh, I, I don't need anything to help me. I'm perfect the way I am. Yeah. Who I surround myself with, what I read, what podcasts I listen to, who I have coaching with, all those things are really important to me. So uh, the three principles, the, the understanding and learning about the three principles had a really big impact on me without reading about it or someone writing about it or me going to a seminar, Jamie Smarts and asking him questions about it. I don't think I would have got it as much. I don't know if Jamie was listening to this now he'd laugh at me and say there's nothing to get, but. Well, and you don't know that either, like that, that you wouldn't have got it as much, you know, like these are ideas. Those are things that have been fun and comfortable and enlightening and, and really helpful to you. And that's fine. We all have those things. But like, it doesn't mean there's a map for that. Like no one's going to find a map. But here's the thing. Here's where it gets way easy. It's like we have common sense that just leads us to things. Like if people, again, like just use your group as an example, if they're in that form and they're feeling supported and they're loving it, that is wonderful because the better people feel, the less we turn to addiction and the more we see. If they're in great relationships, awesome. Doesn't mean you need a relationship. But like if we can just go by the way a kid would navigate life, if we can just do what feels good, do what appeals to us in a moment, do what we like to do until we don't like to do it anymore, it sounds way too simple for a mind to grasp. But I believe I've seen that life is that simple. We mm. come equipped, with, you know, with a we just follow hunches and we do things and we use common sense to build each of our own maps. If you want to make it a map, but it's not really, it's just us doing things that make sense. And then that stuff's helpful and it's not necessary. I mean, you, and there's not one thing in there. I mean, that's like necessary. Yeah. You, you yourself suffered from severe anxiety, right? Yes. So, and, and you still suffer from anxiety now, but I guess we dropped the severe. I dropped the suffer. Yeah, suffer. So what was it for you that, how did you get to this point where you saw how simple it was? Because I imagine at the time when you was really suffering, it, it wasn't simple. How, how did it work out for you? I have no idea. It's so funny. Like, I mean, my anxiety was a while ago and, and I, it wasn't around knowing anything I know now, anything we've been talking about, this stuff. Right. I got over anxiety that to, and to me, that's amazing. <laughs> like I, you know, there's a resilience in there that somehow, you know, yeah, I went to some therapy and never felt helpful. Um, I took some medication for a while, never felt helpful, felt worse. And then I just, I don't know. It just started to kind of fade and I just, something built up within me and I, I just went out with my life and then I wasn't so anxious anymore. And then I learned a lot of what we're talking about here and life got really good, really easy. But so, so, but I think that's important, you know, it's like, I didn't do anything that I'm aware of. There's a resilience in us that I apparently just took over in me and I, and anxiety looked different and, and I could cope with it and it just didn't look as bad. And now it really looks even more different. I still can't see how the resilience would just magically kick in when it's not been there for so long. I cannot get past. There must be a trigger event, something. I mean. Well, what about like, you know, to go back to the weather metaphor, like if the sky is always blue, what's the trigger event that kind of clears the clouds and then you see the blue sky again? I mean, there's, you know, it's maybe that's not a great example because there's like environmental cycles and all of that kind of stuff. But it's like our wellness is in there. The resilience is there. It's never been anywhere else. The door always just was open. You were free. 
but but there's just thinking in the way and that thinking is is designed to shift and move so when it moves in a certain way your resilience is right there this is all about story then isn't it this is about at the time that i gave up drinking alcohol as everybody who listens to this podcast knows my marriage was falling apart my wife and i were drinking too much i thought my wife was alcoholic she wouldn't quit and i said to myself i'm going to quit and then hopefully she will quit i'll be a role model and then I picked up Alan Carr's book. I read it and then I quit. And then somebody says to me, how, how did that, how did you quit? Tell me how you quit. And then I think to myself, well, how can I, how can I help this person quit? So I go back into my life and I think about what were the key milestones that happened. And I associate divorce, the, the, the need to save my marriage. So then I conjure up this principle that says you need something um, to fight for. And then I, I, I the book says that uh, alcohol has no value. So then I start going, psychologically, we need to understand that alcohol has no value. And really, it's as human beings, we are, we are born, we're, we're born and we come into the world. And the first thing, one of the first things we love is to read books or to have books read to us. And it's almost like we become story creating machines that is always looking to apply a story to an event that's happened in our life. Because the reason I'm saying that, Amy, is I don't know. I really don't know if I would have quit or not had I stayed with my wife. I really don't know if I would have quit or not if I hadn't read the book. I really don't know. But I, I have a real good gut feeling that my resilience would have shone through and I would have quit. Yeah. So I, it, I get it. it. I'm getting it. It is more simple than what it is. And I think our habitual nature of applying a story or a narrative or searching for a reason all the time gets in the way. I love that. I mean, that makes such sense. And, and we all do that. I still do that all the time. Like, look back for causes and this and that. And the truth is, like you're saying, we we're making that up. We don't know how could we ever know what would have been, you know, and, and we never know what really caused anything. And to me, it just makes so much sense to see whatever happened in the world happened in the world, but base in a more essential way, resilience and health are there. And there's only thinking that can ever cover them. So when that thinking clears, you're home free. And that thinking clears all the time for people. Why are we so afraid of simple? Why, why do we, why do we need to make things so complicated i think it's just because we're smart we have brains and that's what brains do that's just how i like to see it it's like when we get in our conceptual mind i'm just writing about right before our our talk here i was just writing an article about this um you know today's my son's sixth birthday and i remember so clearly i always get very emotional on my kids birthdays because i just remember the day they were born so yeah. you know, like yesterday so it's like six years to go today like i just saw him and he as far as I can tell, as far as I'm guessing, he was preconceptual. He was just there, like mm -hmm. in life, and you see it, you know, in baby's eyes. It's like they don't have all this thinking and separation and distinction and all of that kind of stuff, you know, and complexity. It's like life is just one thing. It's like, oh, I'm alive. Done. End of story. And then as we get older and get into our heads, and especially as life looks scary, things happen and we go into our heads to try to figure it out, you know, and we're encouraged to do that. Again, we're encouraged. Use your mind, use your imagination, think about it, use your brain, you know, like, so we get, we start to retreat into this conceptual world and in the world of form and the concepts, it's very complicated and complex not always in a bad way i mean even things of form are very complex if you look under a microscope you know it's not bad but but it's like the form or the formula you know before all that human brain stuff and physical stuff i think life's really simple and we just get out of the habit of uh, i mean maybe how you'd say it like we get out of the habit of hanging out there we get into the habit of hanging out in the concepts you just rem you reminded me of a, a really good example when you when you shared your birth experience then you know 15 months ago my wife and i decided to have a home birth and um it was a long labor some like 48 hours from the start and people who say that's not proper labor it looked like it was proper labor and my wife would say it felt like it 
I remember being in the pool, just me and her, holding her hand, really trying to keep her focused on me um, and our love, our connection. She was breathing really heavy. It was very painful. And then out of nowhere, she pushed me away. She got into a position that she'd never been in in the, in the 48 hours. And she shouted to the midwife, I'm ready. And I bring that up now because she had never experienced that before. It was her first child. Mm -hmm. But in that moment, throughout all that pain, all that suffering, all that madness that was going on, she knew very simply what to do without even thinking about what to do. Yeah. She just did it. And then before you know it, out comes this baby. And I'm looking at her thinking, wow, women are the most incre incredible people in the world. Uh, because how, how do you know? How do you manage that? And then, and then 16, down, 16 years down the load or whatever, I don't know, she could get herself in a funk and she will not even be able to stop herself from drinking because it's raining outside. Yeah. And she'll think that it's all so complicated and so confusing. And yes. um, I think that's a beautiful and uh, especially for the women listening to issue about children to think back to that moment about how you just knew what to do. Yeah. And how the baby comes out knowing what to do. Yeah. To make that even baby. better. Yeah. <laughs> nestle and do whatever they do and it's like that that is there clearly and that's such a cool way to see it. it's like the baby came out knowing but your wife who's you know not a baby anymore she knew in that instant too even in the middle of pain and suffering and mm -hmm. probably her mind going a million different places that was stronger it was bigger it broke through and mm -hmm. she just none of that thinking mattered and she just did what was to do that's you know that's like the resilience like the wisdom that's always there no matter how far away we get it almost seems to me like, uh, and every time, every time I open my mouth here, I'm waiting for you to go to me, no, Lee, that's not it. But um, it's almost like we need to return to having faith in ourselves, in a way, trusting that we, we know that we can, we can do this. So if someone says that they want to stop drinking alcohol, trusting that you know, your yeah. body and your mind knows yes. how to do this. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not even, no, totally. And, and it's faith, but it's almost not even faith in yourself so much. I think of it, I mean, maybe that's the way you think of it and that's fine. But I think of it as like, you know, that's what understanding our nature does. It kind of naturally gives you faith when you see, wow, I never lost this. That is always there. It's our design. Then there's, you know, it's not even a question of faith. It's just seeing. Yeah, you're right. Is, you're right. This is a perfect way to end, Amy. If you're listening to this, everybody, you know how to stop drinking alcohol. You know how to do it. Your body knows how to do it. Yes. It's a poison. doesn't want it in your body anyway. You know, just let your body and your mind tell you how to do this. Listen to it. You know what to do. Yeah, it's really helpful um, to take classes and have coaching and read books from the likes of Amy and myself, but you know what to do. Yeah. And, and how many of us, by the way, have been on a bloody training course, finished it, uh, or halfway through it, had some sort of light bulb moment, sorted your life out in whatever way you went to try to do on a training course, and then turned around and said, that guy never taught me anything. I, I, I knew all that, because that's what happens all the time. Yeah. It's like you just wake up, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Amy, it took me an hour, but I finally <laughs> got somewhere. It was awesome. No, I so love this so conversation. I, so I, I'm pretty sure whoever's listening to this probably got somewhere too. I hope so. Um, Dr. Amy Johnson, it's been a wonderful pleasure to have you on the Alcohol Addiction Podcast. I want to thank you for helping people to realize that they are perfectly normal and have the ability to um, do whatever they want to do in the world and uh, for uh, joining us today I'll, I'll leave um, links to all your resources and your website you have a wonderful blog by the way you're a wonderful writer so i just wanted to say that as well thank you thank you, thank you so much lee it was great talking with you